Hey guys, it's Kira and welcome back to another weekly vlog. It is currently Saturday morning and I actually have a bit of a different weekend ahead of me than my usual, which is obviously just reading, baking, going out for coffee, repeat. <laughs> so although I love those weekends and they are genuinely the best way to spend a weekend in my opinion, this weekend I'm going up to Glasgow with my dad and my brother and my grandma to go and visit some family. So my dad's dad, my granddad, is from Glasgow originally so um, his family still lives up there, most of them. He was kind of like the only one who moved down to England I think. So we're going to go up and visit them and also a few years ago when my granddad passed away we ended up taking his ashes up to where his family lives um, and finding this really beautiful spot and we scattered the ashes there and it was all a very very lovely but since that was just before lockdown started like a year or two before lockdowns which is obviously like such a time warp and um, we haven't been up to visit since then so now that lockdowns are obviously all over we're going to go up visit some family who are obviously like I said still living there um, and then just yeah enjoy a couple of days in Glasgow as well while we've made the journey so we're heading up this morning I'm very glad to not be doing any of the driving because that sounds absolutely horrific to me but either my dad or my brother is driving I'm not sure who and I'm just going to be sat in the car for like three and a half hours enjoying the journey then we're going to go visit people do a few things up in Glasgow stay the night and then come back at some point tomorrow afternoon so quite a short trip but definitely a different and more exciting way to spend a weekend than the way that I usually do so looking forward to that and of course because I'll be sat there for three and a half hours either side of the journey with absolutely nothing to do but just let time pass me by, I'm going to be trying to do quite a bit of reading during all of the driving segments of this weekend. So let's get into what books I'm planning to read this weekend. First up we have a follow-up to a book that I actually read just a few weeks ago and that is Infamous by Lex Croucher which is the follow-up to Reputation, the first book in the series. And I absolutely loved Reputation, I thought it was such a fun book and absolutely perfect for anyone who, like me, is a big fan of the Bridgerton series and all of the like little quotes on these books and the reviews and everything liken it to Bridgerton and I just think Bridgerton is a wonderful series and is such a fun amalgamation of like Regency inspiration with modern like themes and I absolutely just love the way that like historical fiction and modern fiction meet in Bridgerton both in the books and in the series but I think the series really summarises what makes it so wonderful and so exciting and this just feels like that in book format and I think the difference between this series and the Bridgerton book series is that the Bridgerton book series is definitely marketed at an older audience I would say like probably when she was writing it the author was aiming that at like middle-aged women whereas because of the popularity of the Bridgerton TV series with the younger audience I think Lex Croucher has really tapped into like the ability to take that like Regency meets modern vibe and bring it to a younger audience so the characters who who these books focus on are in their early 20s it's very much like coming of age but in a regency setting however with very modern and more scandalous themes than you would get in actual regency novels and things that were produced in that time period so obviously absolutely not historically accurate in the slightest but I'm not really bothered about that and I think that they are very very fun so I loved Reputation and I'm hoping to enjoy this one just as much it focuses on a completely different main character so I'm unsure whether any of the characters from Reputation will be in this one or whether it's just going to be like similar setting but completely different characters I don't know and I don't mind either way but I know that I love Reputation so much that this one is sure to be another success for me or at least I'm hoping so so that's book one and I feel like that's going to be like my light-hearted read for the weekend and then for a more dark and serious read we have The Bay by Ali Reynolds which is a thriller I feel like Without knowing anything about this book, the front cover just immediately screams thriller to me because that sea just looks so mysterious and dark and like sinister almost. And I don't know what this book is really about, but I do know that it says the waves won't wash away what they did. And that is enough to make me intrigued and want to read this book. Because it is a thriller, I haven't really done much deeper diving other than knowing that it just looks intriguing from the cover because I like to go in relatively blind and just see what mystery awaits me. So I I think this is going to be definitely a page turner which is exactly what I need for a three and a half hour car journey so with that said I've got lots of good books to read well two good books but I think that will do me for the weekend um, and I'm going to be doing some reading 
on the car and then also uh, when we get to the hotel I suppose like I don't know how well I'll sleep because you can never tell what hotels are going to be like so at least I'll have two good books to keep me company in case I don't have a good night's sleep but those are going to be the books that I'm going to try and get through this weekend and because I won't be as busy as normal in the sense of like literally just sitting still for three and a half hours I'm hoping to actually get through quite a few of the chapters of these books uh, over the next few hours in the car so I'm basically planning to maybe just like read a couple of chapters of one and then a couple of chapters of the other and just keep things fresh so that I just get through the journey and I'm hoping that reading these books will just make the car ride absolutely fly by and I'm also manifesting that we get to stop for coffee at some point because that would just make the whole experience just that little bit nicer. So that is basically my plan for the weekend. I've probably got about 45 minutes until my dad is picking me up to set off to Glasgow so I think me and Jay are going to go out for a little walk just so that again not to sound like a complete broken record but on account of sitting down for the next three and a half hours with literally nothing else to do but sit I think it would be nice to go and get some steps first thing this morning just so that I've done at least a little bit of activity before literally just sitting still for like three and a half hours so all that said welcome to the weekend and I'll catch up with you in a little bit arrived in our hotel but I have to admit that what I did on that car journey was not a single page of reading I obviously brought my two books so we of course have um infamous and the bay with me they were in my bag the whole time but the conversation was just simply too good in the car so didn't end up picking out my books because that would have just been rude and also I brought them with me to keep me entertained in case the drive was boring but it didn't end up being boring so I didn't end up needing those books but I am going to be doing some reading later but we arrived in Scotland probably like just after midday then we went straight to Loch Lomond which was so so beautiful although extremely windy and I absolutely dread the moment that I'm gonna have to brush my hair because I just know it's gonna be so so knotty. So we went there had a lovely coffee and just enjoyed the views and then we ended up driving up to the place where we had scattered my granddad's ashes a few years ago and that again was just a really really beautiful location um, and just like such a nice little spot so obviously that was really lovely. Then we've made our way to the hotel got settled and now we're gonna be heading out for dinner which I'm so excited for. We're going to somewhere called Pizza Punks which has restaurants in a few different places I think there's even one in Leeds but I've never been to it before but it sounds absolutely amazing they apparently have an amazing vegan mac and cheese on the menu as well as like a DIY pizza menu with some really nice toppings including caramelized pineapple so just opening up the floor here because I haven't got any strong feelings either way about whether pineapple does or doesn't belong on pizza because I actually think that the, as long as you have something really salty with it, like an olive, that I think sweet and salt is a great combination. So I can see that it would work, but it's not a topping that I get personally very often, but I don't feel offended by it. But when I saw on the menu that there was caramelized pineapple, that just sounded really, really in, like enticing for some reason. So I'm thinking I might go for caramelized pineapple, they have rosemary and garlic roast potatoes, which I think sounds incredible for a pizza topping. And then I might go for like olives for that salt factor. And I think that might be what I go for for my pizza. So we'll see when I get there, but that's kind of what I'm thinking at the moment. But I would love to know if you are a pineapple does belong on pizza or pineapple should never go on pizza kind of person. Cause I know it's quite divisive and I will give you my conclusive answer tonight after I've had pineapple on my pizza. But at this moment in time, I don't feel like it's very offensive but I know to some people it is like sacrilegious so gonna be going out for pizza and then when we get back I'm obviously gonna be in this hotel room on my own all evening so I reckon I might then make the take the opportunity rather to get started on some reading but for now absolutely ready for a delicious dinner so I'll catch up with you in a little bit after I've eaten and I'll let you know what my pizza was like and then we'll get on to some books.
right, well I have made it home to York and I am exhausted, which is kind of ironic because I have spent a large proportion of the last couple of days just sitting still doing nothing at all because we obviously had a long drive to Glasgow yesterday and then another long drive home again today. But something about just sitting in a car for so many hours on end with nothing else to do but just sit there really takes it out of you more than you would expect and it's really strange because I'm normally quite active on my weekends and I do lots of things whereas I don't usually feel super tired on the weekend because it's your weekend and you're not at work but this weekend I have literally just been sat there just sitting in a car for so many hours and I feel tireder than I ever normally do so that's a strange phenomenon but I think traveling especially like two long days of travel back to back because we obviously went Saturday came back Sunday um, and then sleeping in like an unfamiliar bed and all of that kind of stuff in a hotel it just really like you don't feel as rested as you normally would on a weekend even though when you logically look back on it you haven't actually done that much activity it just feels like your body is wiped out so although I had a really good time on the trip and it was nice to spend some time with my family I was very very glad to get back home to my own house this afternoon I am so excited to sleep in my own bed this evening evening but while on yesterday's car journey I had absolutely no luck with reading whatsoever today I managed to read the entirety of Infamous and I loved this book so so much I was singing the praises of reputation a couple of weeks ago but this book exceeded reputation a million times over I absolutely loved this book I thought it was so much fun and I just cannot recommend it highly enough so I started it last night when we got back from dinner so just to quickly divert I would like to add that my pizza was so so good. I got the caramelised pineapple with roasted rosemary and garlic potatoes and olives so I got like quite salty flavours from the potatoes and the olives and then I got obviously a really nice burst of sweetness and juiciness from the pineapple and I think it worked really really well so there's my answer on the pizza and pineapple debate. I think it's perfect as long as you pair the pineapple with something very savoury and salty but keen to hear what, what you guys think about that but I really enjoyed it and then when we got back I went to the hotel had a cup of tea in bed and started reading Infamous and it was really really interesting to begin with but then I made my way through a good 300 pages of it in the car today and like I said honestly just obsessed I think this was such a fun book I think Reputation felt very much like Bridgerton in its style and the way that the book kind of like unfolded. This one didn't feel quite as Bridgerton-esque but it actually felt a lot more aligned with my type of book and I'll explain why in just a moment. But it did have elements of Bridgerton with it and if you are looking for a Bridgerton comparison I would say that our main character in this book is called Edith but she goes by Eddie and also sometimes Edie but Eddie is her preferred name um, and she is like a bit of a radical she doesn't necessarily want to go off and get married and she wants to become a famous writer and so if you're looking for a Bridgerton comparison I would say that Eddie is very much like the Eloise Bridgerton of this story and that she is very intelligent and I don't want to say outspoken but she is confident in her opinions but also struggles sometimes to appreciate that other people don't have the same experience and privilege that she does. So I found her to be a very interesting character and Eloise is my favourite from Bridgerton so I really enjoyed seeing like that initial comparison between the two but ultimately the premise of this book is we have our main character Eddie and then also her childhood best friend Rose and they are both in their early 20s um, and Rose is from a wealthy but ultimately more like middle class family whereas Eddie's family is from more of an upper class background meaning that Eddie has a bit more freedom in what she chooses to do and whether she decides to get married whereas Rose wants to make sure that she can secure a future for herself and so Eddie has no interest in getting married and can't understand why Rose would want to get married at all and then when they both go out into society Rose is obviously approaching marriage from a lot more of a pragmatic point of view and it causes a bit of a rift between these two but throughout going into society they manage to come into contact with this very um I guess like a lively group of artistic poetry types kind of likened to the Lord Byrons and Percy Shelleys of the world and those characters are mentioned in this book as like a parallel type of group of people so you understand exactly what kind of group Eddie and Rose have kind of gotten themselves into and Eddie adores this as a concept because it gives her this opportunity to be surrounded by all of these like radical free thinking creative people whereas Rose doesn't feel quite so comfortable and it's kind of about them finding their way 
surveying society and figuring things out and meeting people who at first potentially seem like they might be like really exciting to spend time with and then later reflecting and figuring out maybe that wouldn't be the case. So I loved this book. A large proportion of it takes place in a like crumbling gothic kind of like a uh, mansion house called Bead Hall I think it's called um, and it just is such a wonderful setting. There are obviously references like I said to Byron and Percy Shelley and also to Frankenstein or the modern Prometheus as it's called here um, and I absolutely loved this which means I'm very much excited for my next pick which is actually not going to be The Bay. I've decided to go for a classic and I'm sure it's pretty obvious which one I'm going to be reading but I just think this book was so incredible. It also had such an interesting cast of characters and the way that it explored romance and the way that marriage can be both a thing of love but also a very like um well thought out social move and something that can provide you a level of protection regardless of like whether or not you're interested in that particular person which is really interesting and I loved the way that it explored um, the boundaries between like friendship and romance and it was just a really really fun book that explored some serious topics but I just think this was so 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 much fun. I loved Reputation but this one like I said was just incredible for me and I absolutely loved it so I'm really glad to have read this one this weekend. And of course that means the next book I'm planning to pick up is going to be Frankenstein by Mary Shelley which also happens to be this month's pick so it's currently August as I speak right now it's the 21st of August and I'm currently <laughs> somewhat hosting an A to Z of classics read along although during my couple of months reading hiatus I did fall off the bandwagon but I decided to pick back up exactly where we are with August which is obviously the pick for the letter F and we're going to be reading Frankenstein by Mary Shelley and this is a long time favourite of mine I read this for the first time when I was I think about 17 years old and it was actually one of the books that made me want to consider like going to university and studying English literature because I just loved exploring Frankenstein so much so I haven't read it for quite a few years now but I know that I love it and having just seen like a modern take on the gothic genre I'm very excited to dive into a classic gothic novel and revisit an old favourite of mine so that's going to be the next book I pick up I think I might try and do some reading this evening but for now I'm just going to enjoy being home have myself a cup of coffee and maybe fall asleep on the sofa because I am knackered. I don't even need to say it because you'll probably see it in my face but I am so so tired. It is now Tuesday lunchtime so a couple of days have passed since I came back from my little weekend escapade to Scotland and I'm still exhausted so I'm now thinking that maybe it wasn't the travelling that was making me tired and maybe I'm just like coming down with something or potentially the mornings are getting like a little bit darker now with each day that passes and so it feels like it's just a little bit harder to get out of bed in the morning super early so maybe that's what's making me tired but I don't know what it is all I know is that I am absolutely exhausted but it is Tuesday lunchtime and I wanted to talk to you about Frankenstein because I started this book um, or rather started my reread of this book yesterday evening after I finished work and I'm only like a few pages in I'm on page 32 so haven't made much of a start on it but what I've read so far is so so good and for anyone that doesn't know Frankenstein starts with a collection of letters so I have read all the way through those letters and I'm now getting into like the official chapter one but basically those letters are I don't want to say irrelevant to the plot but they kind of give you a bit of background but they're not really consequential for what you're actually in there to read if that makes sense. So we have this character called Walton who is a man from England who has come over to Russia with the goal of basically like chartering a ship and finding a crew and he basically is just in pursuit of glory and wants to find some like un... I guess like uncharted land basically and wants to be like the founder of somewhere so that he can get all of this glory and wonder back in England and basically his lifetime goal is just to like have that sense of glory for having like achieved something that no one else has ever done so he's like very driven by ego I guess you could say and on this trip he's in his ship and they're in the arctic and then they're trapped in ice and on this ice they find a man who basically is on the brink of death 
They bring him onto the ship to try and like save him basically because they can't leave him out there in the cold to die. Um, and when he gets on the ship, it turns out that this man is Victor Frankenstein and basically through Victor striking up this friendship with Walton, we then hear the story of Frankenstein and everything that happened. And that is kind of what makes it the majority of the book. So the beginning few pages, those first 32 pages are Walton writing letters to his sister about his own goals and what he's doing to try and like achieve them. And then right at the end, we get this introduction of Frankenstein into the plot and that is where we kind of like dive into the main story but looking back I've always treated these letters as the least interesting part of the book and I think that's probably still true but it's interesting now reflecting back on it having not read this book for quite a few years that those few letters really do set up the theme of the novel and kind of like illustrates you the purpose of what Mary Shelley is trying to do before you've even really been introduced to any of your main characters. So with this character of Walton who is driven so entirely by ego and by this pursuit of glory, we see this like hubris of humanity and I think that is ultimately what this book is all about. And so it's interesting to look back and see that like right from the start, the main theme of the book and what she's trying to achieve is like right there in your face, but you maybe wouldn't necessarily notice it because you're not fully into the plot yet and you haven't really seen anything dramatic happen but we instantly see this like revelation of what the book is all about and we get into the crux of the entire plot almost immediately but I just love how the book is written what I've noticed so far is just like how rich with description this book is and I just think it is so so well written and I really really do love like the gothic descriptions of like landscape and everything um, and I found a couple of quotes that I particularly enjoyed so with Walton writing a letter to his sister, he says, and now dear Margaret, do I not deserve to accomplish some great purpose? My life might have been passed in ease and luxury, but I prefer preferred glory to every enticement that wealth placed in my path. And so it's interesting that he views like his ultimate success as something that he is like owed, something that he deserves, something that is like basically belongs to him and he is just like in the path of having to achieve something but he doesn't seem to even doubt the fact that he will he's so driven by that end goal of glory that that's like all he can focus on he doesn't care about wealth or anything else he just cares about glory and this fact of people knowing his name he even makes comparison to himself in the temple of uh, names such as homer and shakespeare and he just has this desperate need to be like immortalized by his legacy which is very interesting and the other quote that we have is one that I thought was very interesting. It's from Frankenstein himself, so our guy Victor, who I try as I might, just cannot like. I know that people are obviously very split in the decision between who they blame as the like evil in this novel as the victor or the creature. And I think ultimately what we discover is that neither, well, actually that's a lie. I was gonna say neither is to blame, but I think that's too generous to Victor because he is ultimately to blame for what happens in this book. But either way, I think that there is definitely a, the exploration of the moral gray is like the theme of this book. And so I know Victor is not necessarily meant to be like a villain, but neither is the creature, but I just find Victor to be so whiny about basically what he did to himself. And so he says here, you may easily perceive that I have suffered great and unparalleled misfortunes. And I think that is just so rich because ultimately he created something abandoned that creature and left it to a life of misery and yet he thinks that his misfortunes are unparalleled I'm like get over yourself Victor get over yourself but I think it's interesting that we get this insight into him and his perspective of the story so early on before we actually even know what has happened so very much enjoying my reread of this book and I'm hoping to do some more reading later on today but as I mentioned it is Tuesday it's lunchtime and on Tuesdays I now go to a running club on a Tuesday evening so I'm actually going to have like my big meal now at lunchtime I'm going to make some pasta so that I've got plenty of energy for the run but also I won't have time to have like a proper dinner later on so I'm going to make some dinner and I'm also in the mood for some baking so I'm going to make the most of my lunch hour and make some chocolate brownies which I haven't made for ages but for some reason the urge has overtaken me so I'm gonna make some brownies do some reading if I have some time eat my lunch and then get back to work and then I'll catch up with you later on this evening probably after I've been to my run club
Well, over the last couple of days, Jay and I have managed to eat 10 out of the 12 brownies that I made on Tuesday lunchtime. So suffice it to say, they were a really, really tasty bake. And I'm so glad because it was literally such an easy grab things that are already in the cupboard kind of bake. Like it literally was like self-raising flour, cocoa powder, some chocolate chips, some pecans, sugar and a vegetable oil and I think that was everything. Oh and a little bit of like bicarbonate of soda just to help it raise but it was a really really simple recipe all things that just happened to already be in the cupboards and they turned out so so good so I'm very happy about that. I don't make brownies or like super chocolatey things very often because a shock horror I'm actually not a massive chocolate person. Like I enjoy chocolate don't get me wrong but most times out of like dessert menus and things I will always prefer the like fruit option like a lemon tart or a cheesecake or a pie rather than like a chocolate fudge brownie kind of situation and so while I enjoy chocolate things on occasion I definitely don't get them that often and so I don't bake them that often like I would rather bake something that's either like caramelly or like fruity so the fact that I have managed to make myself a delicious brownie recipe is a definite win and I don't know what came over me to make me want to make those brownies because like I said they're not like a regular thing that I enjoy but I really fancied it I think I must have seen some on TikTok or YouTube or something but I really really fancied some and it turned out very very well and Jay obviously having eaten half of the 10 that we've eaten so far also was a big fan which is always a win for me because he is such a fussy eater which can be <laughs> annoying when it comes to like planning meals and baking and trying to get someone else to try it so that I don't have to eat all of the food myself and um, but it's a really good thing when he actually likes something because I feel like obviously as a fussy eater he's not going to eat something just for the sake of it being there whereas like if I baked something that was like subpar I'd probably like eat it as long as it wasn't disgusting just to avoid food waste whereas Jay if he didn't like it he would not be eating any extra so the fact that he's enjoyed it enough to go in for like five brownies is a big win and it always feels like a stamp of approval when a fussy person enjoys your baking so very pleased about that. It is now Thursday, obviously, as I mentioned, it's been a couple of days, hence having eaten 10 brownies. Uh, although we've enjoyed them, we didn't eat them all in one night. So it's been a couple of days. And this morning, Thursday morning, I got up and out of the house really early to go and run 13.1 miles. So as I'm sure a lot of you know, because I keep bloody going on about it all the time, I'm training for my first ever half marathon, which is going to be the Great North Run. And I'm running that on the 11th of September. So it's going to be it's just over two weeks away now I think it's like 17 days away so that is very very close and so far in training I had only run 12 miles but that 12 mile run was pre-covid and so I wanted to make sure that I was still like up to speed and up to fitness by making myself run the half marathon distance before race day and like I mentioned in my 10k running video a couple of weeks ago I get really really bad race day anxiety it just fills me with so much dread and so I think having now done that distance it allows me to feel a little bit calmer going into race day because I know that I can do it and so I'll, I'll sure I'll still feel extremely nervous when the day comes around but at least I can like return back to the fact in my head that I have actually done it so that was an interesting way to start my Thursday because I've then just been sat in an absolute like trance like state trying to work this morning meanwhile being absolutely exhausted and it's also interesting I don't know if any other long distance runners can relate to this but you would think that after 13 miles of running you would be absolutely ravenous but when I got back from that run and after other long runs I just cannot even fathom the thought of eating something which I know is bad because you obviously want to refuel as soon as you can but the thought of food just makes me feel so nauseous which is so strange because after other forms of exercise like cycling or swimming I can always eat straight after but with running the longer the distance the less my body wants to eat something so I've now just had a big big lunch because it's my lunch break at the moment to try and refuel because I only ended up having like a little breakfast after I got back and then started work straight away but I'm so happy to have done that distance now because it feels like such a relief and then the other thing to update you on is of course my progress with Frankenstein I'm now on page 50 so I've read a little bit more since we last caught up and I'm still 
are really enjoying it. There are a couple more quotes that I found that basically just add to what I was saying about my thoughts on Victor earlier on. So first of all, he, we are now officially into Victor's story. So he is telling Walter basically all about his life and what led him to be in such a terrible state. And so he is describing his childhood to begin with. And he says, um, I remained for several years their only child. Uh, much as they were attached to one another, referring to his parents, uh, they seemed to draw inexhaustible stores of affection from a very mine of love to bestow them upon me. And then it also says, with this deep consciousness of what they owed towards the being which they had given life. And so he is simultaneously able to recognise how much his life was bettered by having loving and affectionate parents who ultimately chose to bring him into the world and therefore owed everything to him to give him as good of a life as possible. And yet he cannot seem to make that connection to how he has that same level of responsibility to a creature that he chose to bring into being. And so it just makes him so hard to like because he's just got such a self-pitying view where he can only view the good things about himself, but he can't allow himself to recognise the negativity. Or when he does, it's in like a, a sympathy sort of like angling way. So that was the first thing that I had uh, gathered and then adding into that point of like uh, he always is trying to get for sympathy even when he's saying that he's like done something bad he's not like taking any responsibility for it so he says it was a strong effort of the spirit of good but it was ineffectual destiny was too potent and her immutable laws had decreed my utter and terrible destruction so it's almost as though he can like vilify other characters such as the creature or he can like um, put people on a pedestal like he does with his family and view them as like absolutely wonderful benevolent people. But when it comes to himself, he has this view of everything being like predestined and I think ultimately that comes down to him just wanting an out of responsibility so that he doesn't have to t like own up to what he did because he can view it as part of his destiny rather than something that he decided to do. So, still got lots of this left to read, I'm probably about just under a quarter of the way in but still really enjoying it and it's so fun to like read back and sort of like jog my memory on having read it so many years ago but as it is now Thursday I'm going to finish up this vlog here. I feel like this one has been all over the place on account of having a bit of a different weekend to usual and then a week that has just seemed to get gobbled up by time because it is just going so so quickly but thank you ever so much for watching. I will of course be finishing up with Frankenstein in my next vlog. So if you want to hear more thoughts on that, be sure to catch up with me next week in the next one. But thank you so much for watching this vlog and I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.